All right. And we are live. The Working Tools Podcast is live. Good day, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, brother and all, welcome to the Working Tools Podcast, a casual conversation around Freemasonry. First, it's important to note that it, our opinions and our thoughts are our own and do not reflect those of the Grand Lodge of our jurisdictions or the respective craft or concordant bodies, etc. Uh, we encourage you to connect with us and ask questions either here or in the YouTube chat or on uh, um, Facebook um, or our Discord server. Um, and then, as well, if you enjoy our shows, please, by all means, like comment and review us it really helps us with the ratings on google and youtube uh, now that being said let's get on to introductions i'm uh, one of your co-hosts uh worship brother stephen chung from Kelowna, bea beautiful british columbia and uh i'm also a 32nd degree scottish right and past thrice peace and grand master in the valley of vernon and uh with us today we have a uh a whole host of uh, guys to talk about our topic today, but I'm going to pass this torch over to um, very worshipful brother, David Colbath. He's a past master of King Solomon Lodge in number 60 in Auburn, Washington. He's a past district deputy grandmaster for district 13, a 32nd degree member of the Tacoma Valley of the Scottish Rite. David is also currently, or he also currently volunteers his time with, his local DMLA chapter, Rainbow Girls, uh, where his daughters are active. And his, he also serves on several Grand Lodge committees and, of course, dedicates some of his time to this awesome podcast. Uh, take it away, David. Hey, thanks, Stephen. I think you kind of stole all my thunder. I don't have anything to, I'm, I'm me. <laughs> I appreciate that. We, we have... Pump you up. <laughs> well, before we forget, though, uh, I had a special day yesterday, but so did Stephen. And so uh, I want to wish our brother Stephen a happy birthday today. Uh, he's X number of years old, hashtag old man. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I had my birthday yesterday, and it was, it was a great time. We're missing our compatriot Connor today. He's again not feeling well, so please keep him in your thoughts and prayers. And uh, we're, we're pleased to be joined today by two excellent brothers, uh, a past host, David, and uh, also a past guest, Zane. So, David, if uh, you could uh, give us a, a little bit of history about who you are, and and uh, we'll, we'll run back to Zane. Awesome. My name's uh, David Barron. I am a Master Mason at the 127 Lodge in Squamish. I live in Pemberton. I'm a tattoo artist and extremely interested in the esoteric side of everything in life. <laughs> excellent, excellent. And we're also joined by Very Worshipful Brother Zane McKeon. He was uh, uh, also past Deputy Grandmaster in District 13. Woo uh, so go, ahead, go ahead, Zane. Hey, hi. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. My name is uh, Zane McKeon. As Dave said, uh, I'm a past district deputy for the Grand Lodge of Washington. I've served on a number of Grand Lodge committees, um, been Grand Order, Grand Lecturer. And um, currently what I'm working on with the Grand Lodge is the Lodge Leadership Retreat. Uh, so this is an annual event where the up and coming leaders of the state uh, congregate to uh, learn about um, how to run their lodge and how to help them prepare for taking a role uh, an ever increasing leadership role within their lodge, and I've been doing that for for a few years. So that's what uh, that's what I'm working on with the Grand Lodge. So happy to be on the show, and happy belated birthday to you, very wishful Dave Colbeth. <laughs> Thanks so much, appreciate it. Well, we had, we had a busy weekend. We were actually really for life with for the Demolay Boys and uh, and the Rainbow Assembly of Kent, and uh, just a little the the Warm 106 shout out that they got they were borrowing our tent and i said and she said oh there's something would you like some t-shirts and i said if you could get the rainbow girls onto your show that would be really awesome so that uh, <laughs> that uh, shout out for uh for the rainbow girls and for d malay and uh, we had a great time it was a very wet and long night but it was a great event so uh, well thanks guys for coming on and being here we really appreciate it and uh uh today's topic is esoteric masonry or masonry and esotericism and so uh, between Dave and Zane, our kind of co-hosts, we're going to 
turn it over a little bit to them, but uh, the, one of the starting topics is what is also what does esoteric mean? I don't know if, uh, if Dave or Zane you'd like to get started. You're welcome to to jump in. What does esoteric mean? Well, you know, I, I, it's funny. I kind of uh, uh, I hear the term uh, esoteric Freemasonry, and um, I guess sort of two things sort of jump out at me. One is, it, uh, in my humble opinion, it's a little redundant uh, because Freemasonry, by its very nature, is esoteric. Yeah. Um, uh, esoteric is uh, kind of a term. I guess generally you would you would think of it as uh, uh, intended for a. a uh, um, to be understood by only a small number of people, a body of knowledge that's only understood, uh, specialized knowledge uh, that you would only be able to understand through some sort of uh, initiation. And so uh, using that definition, Freemasonry um, is esoteric. Uh, but I think when we use it in the term esoteric Freemasonry, we probably also understand that uh, it's you're you're looking for it's Freemasons who have more of an interest in exploring this facet of the craft, uh, just like other guys are into you know social interaction and brotherhood and uh, you know other facets of the craft. I think of uh, esoteric Freemasonry as sort of that that common that common topic that uh, some brothers are probably more interested in other. Than others. Go ahead, Dave. I completely agree with that. That's um, that's basically why I got into masonry is for that side of things. It, because everybody sees something different in everything, every experience they have. You know, just like you're saying, so many people are there just for the interaction to have a, a group of brothers to have their back. But there's also another side of things where you're watching the ritual and you're seeing it take place and you're also observing and wondering what is this, you know, what is the internal work? What do I do within myself to actually become this, you know, and to live it? Yeah, we uh, think of it as like a Freemasonry as a verb instead of a noun. Yeah, <laughs> Thanks. absolutely. So, so esotericism or whatever it is a real thing, then. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I'll I'll say that I've been to lodge. I've uh, as, as past district deputy, and I've traveled all around the state. And sometimes talking about the word esoteric uh, conjures up, uh, you know, like for some people, maybe something that is dark magic or something like that. Uh, <laughs> And and it's a little humorous. It's and some it's just sometimes just a comfort level what they're willing to explore and talk about. It's like using the word occult. Um, yes. it sounds it sounds a little spooky. It invokes certain thoughts, uh, you know, instantly when you say the word occult. But really, yeah. all occult is is just hidden knowledge. And yeah. I think we could probably all agree that there's a lot of hidden knowledge within Freemasonry not to be understood by someone who isn't a Freemason. Absolutely. Yeah, well, you know, that's one of those things that, you know, I, I mentioned to several people under the good of the craft recently about our podcast coming up. And the moment you say the word esoteric, some people really get their backs up. And, yeah. you know, it makes me wonder why they get their backs up. Because uh, as we were going to do this particular episode, you know, I, I, I started asking more questions. I tried to find a little bit more about, you know, what does esoteric really mean, right? And so I think that a lot of guys really get their back up about it out of more, more out of ignorance, I think, uh, or not maybe ignorance, but um, the lack of knowledge about what it really means and, and, and how it really plays a, a part in our, in our craft. I think so. I think it, it denotes uh, like it, People, because when you don't know something, a lot of people react with fear, mm -hmm. right? And fear of the unknown, thinking that esoteric, maybe that means something negative. What if, you know, what if I'm doing all of these things and I go down this road and this word means something negative that I don't know and I'm scared of that? And I think that's where a lot of people, you know, have that kind of, oh, esoteric, what's, you know? <laughs> 
Yeah, I think there's all there's this fear of uh, of uh, imposing some innovation into the craft, and of course that's a big no no, right? We don't want to we don't want to invent something new. We actually oblige obligate ourselves not to do that. Uh, and so we, I think sometimes just uh, in the comfort zone, stick with the exoteric, uh, the yeah. things that we can easily see. Um, interestingly enough, and I know that we've probably got listeners from lots of different jurisdictions, so I don't know if the, um, if the uh, ritual is exactly the same, but it, you know, at least in Washington, there's, um, and this isn't, you know, ciphered uh, uh, explanation. This is oftentimes quoted um, but Freemasonry consists of a course of moral and philosophical instructions illustrated by hieroglyphics. Um, it goes on to say that it's, you know, taught according to, uh, you know, emblems and symbols and allegorical figures. So at least in our ritual, we actually describe Freemasonry as this, you know, esoteric or occult type uh, order uh, that you're being initiated into. And then the, one of the first things that ends up happening is we, you know, we oftentimes reject that notion and, and go down this exoteric path. And it's a little unfortunate, but I'll give you one other little anecdotal thing because I, uh, there's a couple of other, uh, uh, you know, social media groups, Facebook posts, things like that. There's a, that I follow. There's one that just came up today um, and it's from the, the Facebook group, The Winding Stairs. And I don't know if you uh, follow that or not, but there was a poll today um and it was you know uh describe freemasonry to you today and so far several hundred people have already re responded to this poll um by far and away the largest definition of what freemasonry is is a social group and only 11 percent of the respondents had said that it was uh anything uh associated with the word esoteric an esoteric course of instruction. Eleven percent of the respondents had responded that way. Do you think that that's their, you know, like <clears throat> pollsters? Uh, the way you word the poll and the way they word the questions can can uh, lead you down a path potentially. Was it was it worded in a way that this is what their current feeling of the craft is or what it should be? There, you know, there's a definition. There's a difference between what it currently is and maybe what they think it should be and what they hope it will be. Yeah, it, I'll just read you to the the actual uh, the actual quote. It's only one question. It said, based only on your firsthand experience with actual lodge activities, what is Freemasonry? Not what it should be, but what it really is in practice. Yeah. And the overwhelming number one answer was a social club. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah. Go sorry. ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. I, agree. I think that's by design, though. Because if you had it as 100% everybody's in it just for esotericism, I feel like it wouldn't still be going. You know what I mean? Like that yeah. way is what keeps it alive is that it has this very exoteric side and there's a lot of people doing it just for the physical in the world type of things where it, it then that leaves it for the person who is looking for more so that there is this uh, brotherhood, this group that you can go be a part of and still experience these rituals and you can see different things in it than you know the guy sitting beside you is. You know, like um, Kabbalah talks about how the Bible's written, right? It's written in three different levels. You have the first level, which is the story that tells mm -hmm. you how to live a good life. And then you have a level beyond that, that is the metaphor you know, saying this happens and this is the metaphor for this thing, teaching you to live a good life. And then you have the roots and branches level, which is beyond that, where you go and take the Hebrew letters and you decode them and you understand something completely different, but it's all the same text and yep. you need those levels to keep it alive. Yep. Yeah, it was very interesting. We have, uh, we, we touched on this topic. Uh, we have a more light night in our uh, city and um, that was last week, and we were we were supposed to have a couple of guests uh, there to discuss this very topic, Darren. And that was one of the things that you know, because they weren't there, we ended up having this just really candid conversation, which uh, a lot of the newer guys um, they come in, they come in, and now that now that we're using the uh, 
uh, steps to initiation program and so on, we are now identifying those that are looking for the esoteric side and those who are looking for the exoteric side. And it's kind of cool when you think about the, the different people that are joining for the so many variety of reasons, right? And it's really uh, awesome that we have this ability to give those that are looking for that knowledge uh, what they're looking for. And I really appreciate you guys coming on to uh, talk about it because it enlightens everyone. Yeah, I think I think uh, Dave makes a, a, a really great point that there's really these these uh, just like in reading the Bible, these three different levels. I think there's a parallel uh, within the craft, certainly. And um, you can find all sorts of, of evidence within the craft that that uh, it's a it's a social uh, it, it, it's it's a social science. It requires us to interact with one another. It's not learning in a vacuum, although there is an individual learning but you also go to lodge to have this and create this interaction among brothers uh, to put into practice Freemasonry. So it's, uh, it definitely uh, parallels those three different uh, types of, uh, um, you know, ways to interact and to understand and, and be part of Freemasonry. Right. In our conversations, we, we uh, talked about trying to get education of this type in our uh, lodges and um, our our worshipful master is going to try and do the lodge of instruction type concept uh, now that uh, we had this big meeting last week and, and he sees the benefits to that um, and when you when you think about the um, reaction from some of the guys when you start talking about esoteric or, or exoteric they I can now see why it's not a regular part of lodge education and why um, a lot of guys just frown, frown upon it out of lack of knowledge. Right. Um, and, and it's kind of sad in that sense, but you know, I guess, you know, I wasn't looking for the esoteric side of Freemasonry. I was looking for the, the brotherhood, the companionship, the, the place to, uh, be me and to participate in something that is greater than me. And uh, really, I guess, you know, might be the character in me, but I like participating in degrees. I like the acting and the role model or the role playing and so on. And so I get what I, I'm looking for that way. And, and it's really cool that I get to help others uh, get what they're looking for this way. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a key piece of, you talk about ritual and uh, doing doing degree work and things like that, and that that's an important part of it. The I think that if you were to say the difference between performance and study in the esoteric side of things, it's that they go into deeper understanding of what the symbols. We talk about certain things in our ritual or in our lectures or thing, and then we that's the last time we talk about it or hear about it. Right? We go into more it's going into more detail, learning, and and I. I you know, if we go back to our origins of what Freemasonry was, it was just a group of guys at a tavern, basically, uh, which it, when we use the word tavern now, we think of a bar, but a tavern in ancient times was the central meeting point. So it was really where they, people went to have their meals and their social time together, and they would get together and talk, right? So there was an opportunity for meaningful thought and discourse among men. And I think that's a key piece to esotericism. Well, is it, it, it's, esotericism just isn't uh, the mystical, although it can be mystical. It can be just having the idea of thinking and uh, working together on stuff. Yeah. Well, the way I see it is that I think it's important that the lodge functions in an exoteric way. Because there's certain people who are looking for that internal knowledge and that profound knowledge, and they're going to see it in the physical outworkings of somebody else. Because like when I'm, when I'm in Lodge, like long before I even decided to be a part of Masonry, I was on this path of learning, you know, studying Kabbalah, studying all the ancient religions, um, you know, looking into alchemy and hermeticism. 
and just studying it and studying symbols and what they mean, because as a tattoo artist, I need to know what symbols I'm putting on people and what they mean. And, and you know, that, that matters. Right. So I studied it. And then now going into lodge, seeing the, uh, the rituals take place, I'm, I'm receiving profound, profound insights and understandings of these symbols that I studied before. Now seeing in the ritual, I can look at it and like, oh, wow, that's this and this is that and that means this. So I think it's good to keep it exoteric because the people looking for it will see it. You, you know, know I mean? it's a really interesting uh, thing that you were talking about there. The uh, at, our, at our more light night last week, because we didn't have the guys that planned, we just uh, we asked the newest guy in the room to ask a question. And his question was to each and every on, everyone else in the room, has or, or can you relate a story of how our teachings or uh, uh, our rituals or something impacted your life or uh, made you have one of those aha moments or things like that? And, and it was really cool to hear the different stories that everybody had to share. Um, you know, cause I thought, okay, well, I, through the process, it actually triggered other things for me to remember that, oh yeah, I guess that was a little bit of that too. And, you know, I, I went and I shared my, my thing about, uh, the fact that I've been in lodge 20 years, I've been doing the address of the brethren for, for 17 of those years. And a year and a half ago, you know, things in my personal life were um uh, were going on and i was practicing the ritual to deliver these lectures and it, and it and it connected and it helped me deal with and understand the things that were happening in my personal life which were really unrelated to to lodge but um that lecture pieces of it at that time really it, and and it was really cool so i i, I kind of have a better a much better understanding now of what esoteric means thanks to the fact that we we're going to bring this show on. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> now we're, we're definitely taught within lodge that we, that we learn things within lodge and then we bring them to the outer world and uh, presumably to make our, our, ourselves a better person or a better version of ourselves and, and uh, those around us in our, our, our little corner of the world. Um, and that's why to that point, I think it's, it's very important to take what you've learned within lodge and apply it outside, not the other way around. Don't take things from outside the lodge, import them into a state of meeting and then call that Freemasonry. That's not actually the, the, the direction that I think we're um, instructed to uh, sort of apply. Uh, it's inward within the lodge and then we take that to the, uh, to the outside world. And, and your, your testimonial is an example of that. We were talking uh, the other day, Zane, about uh, the preparation of a guy and how that how the ritual flows. And as you're talking about how things go from lodge to the outside, and and when a guy comes in from the outside into lodge, people think, oh, we're going through the opening, we're going through the closing, and this is kind of boring. And and it, you know, people, well, the ritual is important. It's an important piece of the the development of the esoteric mind and the thoughtful mind, isn't it? Because you have to go from what you were doing before and prepare yourself through the ritual process to be ready for it. Yeah. There's uh, there's an idea that, um, uh, and I'll, I'll dance around the subject as well as I can, because I, I, I don't know if the listeners are Masons or non-Masons, but uh, uh, certainly uh, it's not, there's no, uh, you know, corner of the market in Freemasonry that, you know, the idea that man is a temple. And so there's a lot of parallel between uh, the temple that we meet at, um, the temple that we open, and then we as a temple. And there's a, there's a uh, somewhat famous uh, drawing back to 1754, you can look it up, um, called the Masonic Man. Uh, and it's this uh, caricature of, uh, of a Freemason constructed from um, material of the lodge. And so you can see the square and the plum and you can see the sun, uh, which is the center, uh, you know, for us, you know, kind of the altar. Um, 
and uh, Dave, you're probably familiar with the Masonic Man illustration. Yeah. Um, and there's a little. Oh, what's that? The Solar Man or Solomon. Yeah. Well, and this one's from 1754. It's uh, and there's a little quote underneath it that says, "Formed out of the material of his lodge, behold a master mason rare, whose mystic portrait does declare the secrets of Freemasonry, fair for all to read and see, but few there are to whom they're known, though they so plainly here are shown." And uh, I, I wish I could uh, pop up the the graphic. It's actually really it's a pretty um, interesting looking. Um, uh, you know, portrait from several hundred years ago. Yeah. Uh, this construction of a, what a Freemasonry look, a Freemason looks like out of the pieces of our lodge. And that's, um, sorry to interrupt, uh, Steve, we spoke about this previously, the axiom as above, so below. That's exactly what that means. Because not only does the lodge represent the human body i guess internally not the physical body but the spiritual soul the thoughts the emotions the ideas all of that stuff um that is represented in the lodge which represents what's inside of you but also it represents um the other way into the physical world so you can see the structure of society and understand it in that way. And when you can understand it in that way and understand it within yourself, you can see that by doing this and understanding these rituals in me, I can change myself to act in the physical world, which will affect it. And, you know, it will uh, magnify up and down as you go. Right. And that, and that, really goes deep into the inner psyche of each person. And I think that's what really actually scares a lot of people is to, to think inside themselves. Um, yeah. You know, uh, I want to draw back to our, our, uh, our, our program for today. Our notes there. I want to make sure we touch on everything that, that was brought up. Um, there are a couple things left on there. One is how to introduce to your lodge. And then it says draw from standard, work, ritual, symbols, words, and their meanings, i.e. charity slash agape. Um, can you guys delve into that? Well, I think it's actually kind of what, what Dave was uh, 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 starting to allude to there. And this is kind of uh, the idea of bringing um, meaningful thought and discussion to a lodge function, preferably the lodge meeting. And so we can say that lots of guys can, um, you know, find all sorts of things from Freemasonry and there's social and, you know, a number of esoteric, uh, exoteric uh, uh, aspects to the craft and brotherhood. Um, but uh, without meaningful discussion, it's, it really is just a social club. And so I think that's the secret ingredient that needs to be added to most lodge functions, at least stated meetings. And uh, clearly, you know, when you're at labor, you know, if you're getting together to, you know, go out to dinner or, you know, go to a movie that night, that's, that's just social bonding time. But within the lodge while at labor, the secret ingredient, ingredient I think, to running a really successful lodge is to have this meaningful discussion and you just have to kind of break through the initial barrier of, Ooh, it feels uncomfortable uh, to, to the point where that becomes the norm. And I know that our lodge has certainly turned that, I, I call it the culture corner. We t we've turned that corner within our lodge. So it's, it's odd for us not to have that kind of dialogue uh, within the lodge. And we, you know, we leave and we go out to the dining room and we have, you know, other kinds of conversation. But within the lodge, it's a certain type of conversation that that needs to happen. And maybe that gets to your point about how to introduce that uh, into the lodge. And that can be a challenge for 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 most people. I mean, look at the poll that we talked about earlier. 11% of people think that masonry is is some sort of esoteric art. So if you've got a if you've got a room full of uh, 10 guys that are there at the meeting, statistically one <laughs> is interested in this and everybody else is interested in just kind of having a good time. And so that one person does have a little bit of headwind to 
kind of um, uh, introduce that into the lodge. Uh, yeah. But that person is not alone. There are people like that all over the place in our state, in your state, um, in other lodges around. <laughs> I think that's the first thing is to like find your network. It's not always everybody in your lodge. It's the other guys within your region that are sort of interested uh, in this. I don't know, Dave, what do you, you know, what's your, been your experience with, with this? I completely understand. But I, I take the, you know, in the Bible where they where uh, I'm pretty sure I'm probably paraphrasing, but Jesus says the uh, it is a narrow path. That meaning that that's going to be one percent. Yeah. Of, you know, the people in the room. But that person wanting that esoteric path has a higher duty within themselves to themselves to start that conversation, because that's part of the internal work is bringing yeah. it externally because you know the mystics and the yogis that went and sat in a cave for 10 years and wrote down these amazing things that's not uh how you practice it you know the way to practice it is to live it is to be that yogi in the cave but living every day in the world interacting with people and being that person not just writing about it yeah i i think of it as the uh the stone the builders rejected we get a lot. Of that. <laughs> you know, yeah, and, there's yeah. definitely been times where where my thought has been, you know, rejected. Uh, you know, and uh, and you know, you got to persevere through that. Um, so that's certainly kind of step number one. Um, yeah. I guess step number two is uh, a lot. I think my observation has been that this is somewhat of a lost art within just the. Uh, the what lodges do when we get together. We've just forgotten that we should be doing this and uh, these, having these conversations and exploring these ideas. Um, and and so sometimes there aren't enough guys within the lodge to kind of keep that discussion going. And so my suggestion is, is bring in other people from outside your lodge who can who can talk about these things. So draw on expertise uh, from, you know, your region and, uh, you know, have that be the, the, the person who's delivering the, the, um, uh, you know, lecture for the night or for the presentation for the night. And failing that, start a podcast and bring people on to talk about it. Sure. <laughs> I, I got a good question for David. David, do you, you guys uh, do that lodge of instruction, right? Um, now, has that when when that since that's been implemented in that in the lodge that it has, um, has that driven more visitors, more uh, people coming for that lodge of instruction? Well, we're, I think we talked about this, we're going through a, a, a redevelopment process. In the past, our our third Monday was proficiency focused around the count the constitutions and the the code work. And then, and also the ritual itself. And uh, when when Zane and I were deputy of Grandmaster, then we wanted to try to shift it a little bit and make it more more education based. And people were still wanting to focus on the ritual and not so much on the education. And so we tried to make a lodge of instruction, a general lodge of instruction, and uh, that didn't go so greatly, honestly. It just there's the the one percent was pretty thin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, so so our current lodge of instruction is more process based. It probably shouldn't be called a lodge of instruction. I guess there would, people have their own opinion of what that term means, but uh, our, we're we're relaunching that lodge of instruction in our own lodge, focused on our lodge and helping the guys understand what they should be when they become, when they come in and they go through the first three degrees. Uh, again, that's what they, they don't go back and talk about the symbolism and don't go back and talk about some of the words. And so we're going to try to do that and reintroduce that and then take the next step. If they want to develop leadership and a guy comes into masonry and he doesn't necessarily know for sure what he's going to get. The six steps helps that. But uh, when they get in, even still after the six steps, they get in and say, well, gosh, I got my degrees and then now what? Now I'm just holding this rod and uh, <laughs> or or I'm putting on this apron and what am I really doing here? I'm yeah, we're having a great social time and maybe there's some deep thought happening, but what's more there and how can I find 
uh, so that, that's a good question. How, and probably maybe a better question for another topic. We could probably talk a whole hour on where to find information, but where, where can a guy go uh, if he's looking for symbolism and information? But and before, you, before you answer that, Zane, or before you give some ideas on where a guy can go, I think I may have found this uh, Masonic man. Let me share my screen here and see if this is. Yep, that's the one. That's the one. So I think if I talk, it will make that screen live for the group. I don't know if I can talk long enough to make it so that it pops. No, you just got to share your screen, man. Okay, I'm sharing it. But I don't yeah, I mean, it. you can see him wearing an apron. You can see the uh, the, the the compasses, um, his jewel. You can see the ashlers. Uh, uh, and, let's see, and, and on and on. Actually, there's quite a bit in there. and. Um, some of that I think is veiled in allegory that I don't know that I would talk about on the, on the podcast, but, uh, this is the, you know, the construction of a Freemason using the architecture within the, within the lodge. What a cool, what, what a cool spot to start from, you know, any of our, we call them trestle boards in lodge, but the idea of the, a board of symbols, uh, either that or the lectures or something like this and just start from top to bottom or left to right or whatever, and just start talking about them and learning about them. But where can a guy go if he wants to learn more about symbolism and about esotericism? Is there, is there a, is there a, here's the top 10 books or a short path or other well, than, well, there's, yeah, there's, so, so there's a whole, there's a whole, there actually quite, there's quite a bit out there. Uh, and you know, it's, you just have to kind of start looking around and, you know, with the advent of the internet, uh, uh, it makes the search a little easier, but I would actually just start by saying that there are hundreds of of uh, Masonic books that are available for free on uh, uh, Google, like Google Library. These have all been digitized. They're all, you know, from several hundred years ago uh, or a hundred years ago. I'll give you an example. Um, one of my favorites is called Manual of the Lodge. It's by uh, Mackey, and uh, I think it's that book is worth reading for the footnotes alone. Um, uh, of course, I think uh, probably one of the fountains of this kind of information is the Secret Teaching of All Ages uh, by Manley P. Hall. Um, you can read a book uh, Esoterica by Pike. Um, Sacred Geometry is a su is a subject that's been written by countless authors. So, I mean, I think a lot of it is just finding the parallel to um, uh, Freemasonry. I mean, I think Dave before he before he had run into some technical issues was uh, referring to uh, Kabbalah and Hermeticism. And there's there's I mean, you can you can find that source of information um, pretty readily. Uh, it's, it's just starting is 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 reading it trying to understand it, having that discussion with like-minded people. Uh, and, and I think it's been said before, you're gonna see it from different perspectives and that's why you get into those roundtable discussions so that you can start to learn from another. If you're just getting together down at the lodge to talk about the Seahawks or what's coming up this weekend, I mean, you're passing up a great opportunity to get together and talk about something, you know, Masonic as opposed to, you know, simply social. That's not to say that having social isn't fun. It's just what a rare opportunity we have as Freemasons when we're in lodge to actually talk about masonry. Well, and it's great too, when you, when you can talk with people that you enjoy hanging out with and have that deep and thoughtful discussion about things, uh, it's a, it's, it fulfills all of the buckets in life. You know? Yeah. A uh, quick comment from our, our Facebook, I'm sorry, Facebook, our, our YouTube. <laughs> That's not a four-letter word on YouTube, I don't think. But uh, our YouTube chat, uh, Most Worshipful Jim Mendoza, who is going to be on next week, a small plug with uh, Nathan Tweedy. We'll cover that at the end. Uh, he's, he's indicating the new candidate education program in Washington can serve as a bridge toward increased interest toward the more deeply educational topics. And that's, as I was mentioning earlier, for our lodge, that's part of our uh, – Lodge of Instruction or education track that I've implemented or is going to be implementing. Uh, New Kent Education is absolutely integral in helping someone understand a little bit more behind the degrees, what it's about, talking about the lectures and describing some of the symbols. He also says the Symbolic Lodge curriculum of the Scottish Rite Master Craftsman Program is another great place to start. And I would agree, yeah. neat place. 
Yeah, those are really good points. And and now we're starting to get into like, how do you implement this into your lodge? Um, and uh, so I guess to me, it really revolves around how does the lodge define proficiency? How does how do how how quickly are you advancing candidates through the degree? And if if you're in a lodge that requires an entered apprentice to simply learn and memorize their obligation, and then now they're ready to move up to a fellow craft, you've you've again not taken advantage of a, of a very rare and unique opportunity for the candidate to learn more about that degree before they advance. And so by the time they get to a master mason, if they've been learning about these degrees all the way along, you, you've got this well-rounded master mason who can talk about these things. So I'll give you an example. So to reference uh, what Jim was talking about, the new candidate education program uh, within the jurisdiction of Washington is actually mandatory to give to, to each candidate. It's not mandatory whether they take the test, uh, which is really kind of a self-test, but um, certainly passing that out to each one of the candidates. Um, in some lodges, uh, and I think hopefully we start to see a little more of this happening within the craft, there's this idea uh, about submitting, they call it submitting a piece of architecture to the lodge. And this is each candidate in, in lodge reviewing and presenting to the brethren what they've learned about the degree. So it's not just catechism memory. It includes that, all about the catechism, you know, the entire posting lecture, but also standing up in front of the brethren and talking about what they've learned from this degree. Um, That's an interesting concept. I, I hadn't thought about having them present what they've learned about the degree. Um, but this program that Jim's talking about, it, uh, it sounds a lot like our mentorship program. Um, and, and we did a, we took the mentorship program that we got handed from our grand lodge and we gave it a bit of a twist. And so as our mentors are coaching the ended apprentices and fellow crafts through their um, proficiency, uh, they're at, they're going through and analyzing the, the words, every paragraph in the proficiency with the, candidates so that they actually have an understanding of what they're talking about, what it means and, and so on. And of course that always comes into, you know, uh, segue conversations. <laughs> and sometimes they'll, you know, they'll spend two hours talking about the meanings of what they're talking about rather than practicing the proficiency. And uh, yeah. because our, our the leader of our mentor program, Bob Goslin is, um, very firm on the fact that you need to understand what it is you're repeating, uh, or, 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 or it's useless. And so I, I, I kind of like that. It falls right in line with what you're talking about there. Um, so that's, that's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, if you can't, if you can't, uh, talk about what the three movable jewels are and what the three immovable jewels are in an entered apprentice degree, are you really ready to move up to a fellow craft? I mean, if you can't even like talk about what they are and just right. you know, describe them, um, yeah. uh, and yet you look at, you look at advancement records and a lot of guys will move from a EA to a fellow craft in one month Yep. and then from a fellow craft to a master Mason in one month. And then yep. we get these master Masons and they don't know what else to do. And they kind of get bored and the lodge doesn't have anything for them, you know, to study and to learn and to discuss. And where do they go? They go right. NPD. Well, we, you know, like, I was. I was initiated, passed, and raised October, November, December, right? Now, I'm, I'm a little different in the sense that uh, I had the benefit of being in Malay, and so I kind of had an understanding what, you know, the exoteric part of Lodge was, and that's what I expected. And now we've slowed the process down, and, and we don't do bang, 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 uh, yeah. because – it messes with the mentorship part of the program and the education factor. And we like the fact that our guys that now come in and prove up um, actually sound like they know what they're talking about rather than sounding like they've recorded it. I think it all falls to expectations too. When, when we were <clears throat> brought in or I was brought in, uh, there was a different level of expectation and or not different necessarily, but a level of expectation that I kind of assumed that I was going to have, 
uh, every Saturday morning, I'd have to come down to the lodge or go somewhere and sit for two or three hours and have some kind of college course on masonry, a regular, a regular series of education. And that was instilled in us by our deputy for the proficiency and the ritual process, but the education piece didn't necessarily occur. And so that became my expectation that I didn't have to do that. And I said at Grand Lodge a couple of years ago, I said, if, if, I, if I said, hey, every Saturday, we're going to have uh, education from 8 a.m. till noon, and we're going to dive into the esotericism, I think everybody would laugh at me. But if that had been your expectation from the very beginning when you joined, that every Saturday or every other Saturday at from 8 till noon, you, you just would you'd dial it into your schedule and you'd be there. And I, we would all know what the three movable jewels are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For sure. Well, uh, we're getting pretty close to the end here, but uh, we've had some great comments uh, uh, on our, our live chat. And I'll see if you're following those as well. Uh, the Ernie talks about the Grand College of Rites and their establishment and, and uh, resurrecting and abandoned unauthorized rituals and stuff. And that's pretty cool. I hadn't heard about that. So I Googled it and I'm going to take a look at that myself. But uh, are there any kind of last comments or or Items that uh, I, I know we think Dave looks like Dave was able to join us again and he has some technical difficulties. So, good. To, I don't know if you heard any of what we were talking about, Dave, if you want to pipe Not in on anything. Anymore, there. Unfortunately. <laughs> um, did you guys talk about charity? So we haven't was, talked about charity. I was just going to do that. So, one of the last things I'd like to have you guys do is uh, we, we talked about trying to introduce something into Lodge. And so I thought, well, gosh, is there just some little tidbit that we can talk about in the last few minutes that wouldn't be too too deep and too crazy and people could connect it because it's in from the ritual. We talked about pulling some symbolism and some ideas from the standard work and talking about those so that people that are, you know, the, the, not the one percenters, but maybe the 10 percenters that are want to know more. I, I would guess if that, if that poll said, uh, had a second part that said, what is it now? Which is the first part. And the second part was, what would you like it to be? I'll bet the second part, you'd probably get a 10 to 20% where they'd like more esotericism, like more instruction, but currently it's, it's social. So if a guy wanted to introduce something, what's, uh, what's one story? I, I don't know, Dave, if you want to tie into what Zane's going to talk about, uh, he's going to, uh, or if you want to. Yeah, I got a little spiel about charity, but I'm not sure if it will tie into where you guys want to take it. Go, go, go ahead. If you have a little bit and uh, okay. we can tie her in. Well, in Kabbalah, they talk about uh, receiving the light and different levels of receiving, right? It's all about how you fill your cup with that light. And um, the most important thing to know is that in spirit or in emotional world, in that world that exists inside of your head, not outside, um, the way to become something or to move anywhere in the spirit world, you must become like that thing. So to get closer to the creator, or the grand architect, or whatever you want to call the infinite thing that we cannot quantify. The only way to get close to it is to become like it, to uh, show its attributes. And it's and the way they explain it in Kabbalah is that uh, the creator only has the will to bestow. So only the will to bestow delight to its creatures. And us as creatures only have the will to receive because we want everything. We eat, we put everything in, we take stuff. But the idea with charity is that in order to fill your cup, to feel most fulfilled in life, which is what they mean by filling yourself with light, is, is that infinite understanding, um, you must change your will to receive into the will to bestow. So you must then, through your life, want to give people the light. And by giving people light, you will find yourself unbounded and overflowing with it. So the only way to do that is to genuinely want to give for the sake of giving, for that person's well-being and for their life. And what happens is you find that you receive more than you gave, but only so that you can give it away some more. And the idea is to continually do that through life so that you can change your attributes of everything for me. Why is this for me? What can I do for me? You know, into how can I help everyone else? Because that's the most important thing. 
because everybody should be willing to step back into hell to lift out their brothers and go last after everybody else has gone. And that's what they talk about with uh, the will to receive and the will to bestow. And that's what I see in charity and masonry is doing that. Absolutely. And, and you have to, you have to take care of yourself first a little bit. I, I tell the story of, and I'm, I'm shift a little bit here from the deep thought to if you're, if you're getting on a plane and you're sitting in your seat and the flight attendant goes through the, the door closing process and they talk about uh, emergency situations and they say, you know, in the unlikely event of a depressurization, the mask will fall from the ceiling and it says, before you assist anybody else, put your mask on first. Now, why do they do that? They do that because if you don't put your mask on first, you'll be dead. You can't help yeah. the person next to you or the child next to you. So you have to fill yourself, have to take care of yourself first. So put your mask on first. Fill yourself yeah. with, a, with, with charity and love and knowledge so that you can be overflowing uh, to give. Yeah. And, and I think that ties in directly with Zay's yeah. about with his charity and agape, the idea of the root words. Yeah, because what, what happens is is to get to the point of having an overflowed cup to give to everybody else, like you said, you have to fill yours up first. And you have to understand what accepting charity is all about. They have a story in... Um, I forget the name of the, the book, but it, it's speaking about Kabbalah and, and what they're saying is it's an example. So say, you know, you have a really good friend who loves you, cares about you, and they invite you over and they made you this massive meal, right? First thing, because us as humans, we don't think we're good enough for most things. We'd say, oh, no, sorry, I couldn't possibly accept that. I'm sorry. You know, that's too much. Like you spent all day working on that for me. That's too much. I can't accept it. But what they say is, you know, you're taking part in somebody else's giving and that's the most important thing for them. So by saying no, you're cutting off that light from them and yourself. So the best thing to do is say, you know what, that's amazing. Thank you so much. You know, you're, you're an amazing friend. I'm going to enjoy this. This is the most, this is the best food I've ever had because what you're doing is you're not only you're not just receiving for yourself, you're receiving for them because you understand that by them giving is filling them up with light. And that's how you can, that's how you can give without giving, you know. And speaking of receiving and giving, um, of course, our time today is too short for the lengthy conversations I'm sure we could have about this, but um, maybe we could invite the two of you back on for uh, another episode and uh, you know if possibly because it's such a broad topic we could prob probably record a few episodes um, in one session and um, make them maybe shorter and on point and uh, then we can release them on those days where we're ill and can't show up right <laughs> and uh you know that's something you know, that's been talked about a lot and you know it's got some resistance but it's proven to be valuable uh so hopefully we can get you guys to come back on and uh and, and talk more about this because it's been very enlightening and my cup runneth over for sure uh brain can't hold any more at the moment this, this is what we do down at our lodge all the time we get together and talk about masonry and mm -hmm. uh uh, that's where we're happy to have that kind of lodge. We like to get together and have fun, but, uh, when we're down at lodge, we, we talk about this kind of stuff. Um, uh, so yeah, I understand we're out of time and, uh, you know, we could keep going on and on. Um, but, uh, but thank you for having me on the show and, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, happy to chime in anytime, uh, I'm invited. I'm absolutely down to do this again. It was lots of fun guys. Excellent. That's awesome. Well, we appreciate the time you guys have donated to uh, come on here and, and do that. And we definitely uh, will will uh, follow that up and, and do some recording uh, for future episodes. And um, at this point, uh, I'll thank everybody for coming on and listening and watching and, and supporting our podcast. And then I'm going to hand this over to David so he can wrap it up and give a, a, a plug for next week. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, I uh, really appreciate you, David and uh, Zane being on today. And <clears throat> don't forget to give us the old thumbs up and uh, hit the, notif the notification bell if you want to be notified of our uh, of our shows. And 
Also, as Steve mentioned, we're probably going to get some more things on here that are pre-recorded, and so there may be some things happening during the week and not just on Mondays. And so, if you hit that notification bell, it'll ding you and let us know. Like this weekend, for example, is our grand communication, and I'm going to see if I can uh, wrangle our very worship brother there off of the off of the the, sil the ivory the ivory keys. Uh, he's our grand musician this weekend. Uh, if I can pull him off the keys, and we're going to do some interviewing, I think, and I think hopefully the weekend after is the Grand Lodge of BC. They're going to do that up there as well. So we may have some uh, some midweek show material coming up here. Yeah. What do you call it? A vlog. Vlog, yes, video log. And so uh, speaking of plugging for next week, yes, next week we have Nathan Tweedy. He was, I think, senior warden of his lodge. He can correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, he is uh, works at the Baseball Hall of Fame, something that Steve and I know little about. <laughs> I know I know there's uh, three bases and a home plate and there's a pitcher and there's some averages and stuff. And I've been to several games. I, you know, have the beer and peanuts, but uh, I couldn't necessarily tell you about all the details. And so with that, we've are asking uh, most worshipful Jim Mendoza to come back on. He and Nathan are friends and Jim has a passion for baseball and a passion for Freemasonry. And that's the topic for next week is uh, Freemasonry and baseball. So we hope you can join us next week at noon or about that. If we have any technical difficulties, uh, thanks again, everyone, for coming on. We'll see you next week.